want to say thank you to Donna for sharing about our trip to, to hear the bishop. She didn't, she didn't know that was part of it when she went. And she said that, was it Richard that said that? Or said uh, that the lady's job is to lift up the pastor. And, and she did that for me yesterday. She drove and, and she took care of our lunch. And so I think she's practicing that. I mentioned last week with the celebration that I had wisdom teeth taken out and and uh, it hasn't gone very well I have dry sockets so I might pray for my my ability to talk this morning let's pray come Holy Spirit help me to say the words that you would have me to say today use me as your instrument Make my voice your voice. And help us to hear about your amazing grace. How because of your grace we are set free. Free to, to live the life that you intended when you created us. A life of love, of sharing. Help us to hear your words and to respond as you give us the grace to do so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaac told his father that he did not like the music that they sang at their church. His father said, well, those songs were good enough for your grandfather, and they're good enough for me, and they ought to be good enough for you. But if you think that you can write better ones, give it a try. And so he did. During his lifetime, Isaac Watts wrote about 600 hymns. But most of his best efforts were written when Isaac was between the ages of 20 and 22. Some of his songs that you might recognize include When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, Joy to the World, and Marching to Zion. Just think, these were the contemporary songs of his day. You see, before Isaac Watts began writing hymns that rhymed, the songs that were sung in his church were taken directly from the Psalms. And so Isaac's hymns that rhymed and were not taken directly from Scripture were a radical change for the church people of his time. Did I mention that this happened in the late 1600s and early 1700s? That's right. Differences of opinion about what kind of music to use in worship, is that's not a new thing. Worship is important to all of us here, or we probably wouldn't be here. We all have songs that we particularly like to sing in worship. I remember before I became a pastor, the first thing I did once I sat down for worship was take the bulletin and look and see what songs we were going to sing. Were any of my favorites on the list today? We all have songs that we particularly like to sing. Some of us like the old traditional hymns like Isaac Watts wrote, which, you know, were contemporary during his time. Some of us like Southern Gospel songs. Some of us like more contemporary Christian songs like we hear on Christian radio, and some may like other songs. And music is not the only aspect of worship that we have preferences about. For some of us, worship that includes liturgy and creeds touch our heart, while for others, liturgy and creed has no meaning whatsoever. Some of us would like to celebrate Holy Communion every Sunday, and for some, once a month is plenty. You know, often our preferences about worship are tied to our experience of God in worship. For some uh, children and youth went to camp and had an amazing life-changing experience at camp. And they would like to have worship like they had at that camp. And some of us have gone on a walk to Emmaus and we experienced a life-changing experience there. And we would really like for our worship in our church to be like we worshiped when we were on our walk to Emmaus. And some of us grew up in a church with a certain style of worship. And because of our experiences with our family growing up, we would like for worship to be like it was then. 
We all have preferences. But what is the right way to worship? What is the right way to worship? Let's read our scripture for, from Luke 17, 11 through 19 to see what we might learn about the right way to worship. If you're visiting with us today or if you haven't been here lately, we're, we're moving through the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And we're up to chapter 17, and today we'll start with verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master! Have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Today's passage reminds us that Jesus was on a journey. He was going from Galilee up north to Jerusalem where he would be crucified. And along the way, Jesus continued his ministry of teaching and healing. Now between Galilee in the north and Jerusalem in the south was Samaria. I don't know if you can, yeah, I think you can see Galilee up by the sea in the north and then there's Samaria and then Judea and Jerusalem was in Ju Judea. <coughs> Now, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. You probably, you may know that. In fact, many Jews considered Samaritans and the land where they lived to be so unclean that they would not even go through Samaria on their way from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the main reason that Jews went from Galilee to Jerusalem was to worship in the temple. For Jews, there was only one right way to worship, and that was to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And so, on their way to worship in Jerusalem, in order to avoid Samaria, Jews would cross over the Jordan River and travel on the other side of the river until they got down about Jericho, and then they would cross back over and go on to Jerusalem, avoiding Samaria altogether. Now, Jesus was somewhere near the border of Samaria when ten lepers saw Jesus and came toward him. According to the law, any person with leprosy was required to live away from any people outside the village and to stay away from all people who did not have leprosy. And if someone started to come toward a person who had leprosy, the one with leprosy was required to yell out, Unclean! Unclean! to warn other people to stay away from them. So we don't know how these people with leprosy knew about Jesus and his power to heal. But that kind of information does get around. And Luke has told us several times in the past that news about Jesus and his healing power had spread throughout the region. And so when these ten saw Jesus, they joined together and called out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And in response to their plea for help, Luke tells us that Jesus saw them. Now, Jesus saw more than just ten lepers. Ten people that everyone wanted to avoid because they were afraid they might catch that horrible disease that they had. Jesus saw ten individuals who had been removed from their homes and separated from their families and their community because of this horrible disease. Jesus saw each one's 
pain and suffering. He saw their fear and their frustration. He saw their shame and their loneliness. Jesus saw 10 unique and precious individuals whom God created and loved dearly. He saw their individual abilities and each one's potential for a productive life. Jesus saw their need for physical healing and their need to be restored to their community. In response to what he saw, Jesus told them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. You see, it was the priests who had the authority to declare lepers clean. If a priest declared a leper to be clean, then the healed person was to offer the required sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God in the temple in Jerusalem. And then the person could return to his family and community. But there was no point in a leper going to a priest until the leprosy was gone. It was not for healing that a leper went to a priest. The priest did not claim to have the ability to heal. But it was the priest's job to examine those who thought that they were healed and then decide whether or not they really were. A leper was not healed until a priest said he was. So in response to Jesus' instruction, all ten of these lepers took off to find a priest. In other words, they obeyed what Jesus said, even though they could see that they had not yet been healed. They did what Jesus said to do. And on their way, the signs of leprosy disappeared from their skin and they became clean. Now, we don't know what the others did when they saw that they were healed, but we know that only one returned to Jesus, praising God, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. Notice the difference in what this one saw in contrast to what the others saw. Now, they all saw that their skin had cleared up, that they no longer had this horrible disease that had destroyed their life, and no doubt they were all thrilled that they were healed. Perhaps the other nine continued on their way to a priest so that they could be pronounced clean, so that they could worship in the temple, and because the temple was a place to worship. But only one saw, not only that he was healed of his leprosy, but also that the power of God was at work through Jesus. This one who saw who Jesus was. In other words, he recognized that God was present in Jesus. And instead of going to the temple to offer his sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, this man saw that he could offer his sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving at the feet of Jesus. And he was a Samaritan. Now, perhaps the other nine were Jews. And they knew that the place to worship is in the temple in Jerusalem. And for those who had been healed of leprosy, there were certain rituals that had to be followed. Samaritans did not worship in the right place. Samaritans did not go to Jerusalem. They were not welcome there. They were unclean Samaritans. No, they worshipped in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. But this Samaritan saw God in Jesus. And he saw that the place to worship God was at Jesus' feet. Is it possible that a Samaritan could worship correctly while many of the Jews who thought they knew how to worship rejected Jesus and refused to follow him? Jesus affirmed this Samaritan's response and his worship of God at Jesus' feet. Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Now Jesus asked this question not of the man worshiping at his feet, but he asked this question for his followers to consider. See, Jesus' followers were Jews. And he wanted them to understand that it is right to worship God at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus wanted his followers to understand that God loves all people, accepts all people who respond in faith to his son, Jesus. Samaritans and other foreigners like us, I don't think any of you are Jews, I know I'm not. 
We foreigners are welcome in God's family just as Jews are. God's love and grace are freely offered to all people, regardless of their ethnic or religious background. If we recognize who Jesus is and follow at his feet to worship, God receives us. Jesus saw in this Samaritan the faith that saves and changes one's life. He saw in this Samaritan one who had recognized God in the healing power that Jesus offered to him. He saw in this Samaritan one who responded by returning to worship at Jesus' feet with praise and thanksgiving. And Jesus saw in the Samaritan one whose life was changed by his faith in Jesus as a result of his experience of the grace of God demonstrated in the good news that Jesus brought to him through the healing of his leprosy. And Jesus said to this man who worshiped at his feet, get up, go on your way, your faith has made you well. And when he said this, Jesus was not talking about the healing of the man's leprosy. The man had received healing from his leprosy when he responded in faith and obedience to Jesus' command to go find a priest. And all ten of the lepers had done this. But this man demonstrated even greater faith in that he recognized God in Jesus and returned to Jesus to worship God. Because of his faith in Jesus, as one in whom God is present, this man was healed of his spiritual need, his separation from God. In other words, he was forgiven for all his sins and reconciled to God. As a result of his faith in Jesus, this man was made spiritually well. So what about us? What about you? Have you, have you received spiritual healing at the feet of Jesus? Have you recognized that Jesus is the Son of God who mediates God's grace through healing? as well as through teaching and including and befriending and sharing and loving? Have you seen yourself through Jesus' eyes as, though, as someone who is in need of his saving grace? Have you seen that your sins separate you from God and, and from other people and even from the person that God created you to be? Have you seen that you cannot save yourself and that there is no way to be saved, to be reconciled to God except through faith in Jesus Christ? Have you seen this? Have you received Jesus' sacrifice for you? His suffering on the cross for your sins. Have you accepted this gift that Jesus offers to you? Not just that he died for everyone, but that Jesus died for you. Specifically for you. Have you received Jesus' offer to heal you and to make you whole physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Have you fallen at Jesus' feet in worship, offering your whole self and your whole life to him in response to all that Jesus has done for you? If you have never really fallen at Jesus' feet, in gratitude for his sacrifice on the cross for your own personal sins, then I invite you today to fall at Jesus' feet, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to enter into a relationship with God through faith in his Son, Jesus the Christ. If you'd like to do that right now, I invite you to just come forward and I'll be glad to pray for you right now. But if you have already received God's grace through faith in Jesus, so I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have, do you still fall at Jesus' feet in worship? Do you fall at Jesus' feet in worship? In thanksgiving for all that he has done for you. You know, when we become so concerned about where and how we will worship, about what songs we're going to sing and what parts are going to be included in the worship service, we may be missing the point. The point of worship. It's not how we worship that matters. It's not the style of worship or the music that is used. 
Yes, we all have our preferences. We all have our favorite way. We all have our favorite songs. But worship is not about us. Worship is not about us. Worship is about falling at Jesus' feet. It's about humbling ourselves and thanking Jesus for all that he has done for us. It's about offering ourselves to Jesus. To be used in his mission. To share the good news with others. Recently, we had a meeting about the Healthy Church Initiative. And those at the meeting were discussing our answer to this question. What three changes would you most like to see made in your church? And one person said that he would like to see a more diverse congregation. In other words, he thought our church would be better, stronger, more pleasing to God if our congregation was more like the population of our community. We reached more people. And others said that it's unlikely that our church is ever be going, going to become diverse because people in our community who are, who are different from us, they would not like the way we worship. But what if God is calling us to change the way we worship in order to lead more people to know and follow Jesus Christ. Now hear me say this. I am not saying that we're going to change the way we worship. I have no plans to make any major changes in that area right now. But what if God is calling us to change the way we worship? If that would lead more people to know and follow Jesus, would we be willing to make that sacrifice? Worship is not about us. We all enjoy singing our favorite songs and worshiping in the style that we prefer. But regardless of the style of worship we prefer, the right way to worship is at Jesus' feet. It is to humble ourselves to serve his purposes. There was a Samaritan, one who did not know the right way to worship, who returned and fell at Jesus' feet. The other nine probably went to the temple to worship in what they thought was the right way, but they missed who Jesus was. Recently, Deborah asked me if I had read the book Radical by David Platt. I, I haven't read the book, but I had heard about it. And after she asked me if, if I'd read it and she's reading it with the study group, I became curious. And so I wanted to find out a little bit about the book. And I went online. That's, you know, that's where you found out all the information. You go on the Internet. And, and I searched for Radical by David Platt. And I found a, a short video that they made to promote the book. And um, you can find that on YouTube if you'd like to. But uh, in, the, in the video, it's, it's pretty radical. But this statement is what caught my attention. If we form Jesus to look like us and to be who we want him to be, then even when we gather together and sing our praises, the reality is we are not worshiping the Jesus of the Bible we are worshiping and singing to ourselves. Let me say that again. It's pretty radical. If we form Jesus, in other words, if we imagine Jesus to look like us and to be who we want him to be, then even when we gather together and sing our praises, the reality is we are not worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. We are worshiping and singing to ourselves. Yesterday, when Don and I were listening to the bishop, I only took, I only wrote two things down. And I'm usually a note taker, but I, I had heard the bishop speak before, so he, what he said wasn't anything really new to me. But two things that I wrote down. Number one, God is calling us to reach all people. Number two, to do this, we will have to stretch ourselves beyond our imagination. Are we falling at Jesus' feet in worship?